بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين I should first thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me few blessings tonight one is to meet my brothers and sisters here again one is to be able to start this course uh, which inshallah as I will explain is a new kind of development in our Islamic education and we hope that inshallah we can build on these experiences and inshallah come up with a very good a standard inshallah uh, syllabus for adults who want to learn about Islam uh, I am also grateful to the brothers and sisters in uh, the community here and in Madrasa in particular for suggesting to have this course and for organizing and making this a reality. And I'm also grateful to all of you uh, because your presence and your uh, contribution is very important <coughs> and gives us more energy to continue. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have had, as Brother Sajjad said, uh, similar course in several places. Actually, the first book was ready before Muharram. Uh, but we haven't yet printed, we wanted to test it in several places. So first uh, two uh, scholars went from Qom to Tanzania. First we started in Dar es Salaam and Ripas for teachers. Then uh, before Ramadan in Sha'aban, I was again in Tanzania. We had it for Madrasa teachers from Dar es Salaam. Then we had it in Birmingham. Then in August, we had it in Toronto, and alhamdulillah, in Toronto, we had more than 50 people registered from Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, Ottawa, and Dearborn. Then we had it in Hamburg, but for uh, students from universities from UK, Ahlul Bay societies, you know, they came to Hamburg, and we had this course. And now, this is here. And inshallah, it's going to be followed up uh, in other places. And inshallah, from next year we are going also to uh, start offering the second book so next year we'll have two courses first volume and second volume <laughs> but we have had so far two different uh, formats one is like here uh, monday to friday evening then saturday sunday whole day but in toronto and hamburg we had seven full days so from morning till night we had a uh, discussion and group discussion so that was uh, giving us more chance to interact but uh, still, inshallah, I hope you would have enough time for interaction. And you can always, you know, mention your questions, comments, ideas during the session or afterwards. Okay. Uh, what I want to do in the first session is to give you an introduction to the whole th thing, to the whole, you know, uh, package. And then you will see that what is going to be covered, inshallah, in these days and what, inshallah, you can expect for future. Uh, throughout the community, we always uh, have had suggestions that we need to have something systematic for understanding Islam. And uh, alhamdulillah, when it comes to madrasa level, we have had several initiatives, although still they are developing. But we have several syllabi for madrasa level. But after madrasa, when it comes to end of higher school or you know university level, we don't have anything you know concrete. So this is why we, uh, in 
home with some brothers. Uh, we decided to work on a package for the people who are finishing high school and they want to go to university or to work or to get married. Having everything together, not taking for granted anything, not saying, you know, that they must have studied this before, they must have learned this in the mosque. No, we want to make sure that nothing is missing. Even if they have studied before, maybe they haven't, maybe they haven't studied in depth or in a very critical way. So this is the time to have a little pause and think about everything seriously and as a system. So we had many, many meetings. This has started with about five years ago. Uh, many, many meetings, even just for the first volume, we had more than 30 meetings to find out what is the best way to uh, plan. The outline is very important. Indeed, the content is still maybe is developing, but I think the outline is the most important thing. We studied books written by Muslims, non-Muslims, you know, Farsi, Arabic, English, whatever was available to us. But we started also thinking ourselves based on our experience and came up with this plan. And in the last few years, I've always been sharing this, maybe with some of you also, I have already shared this, uh, to get feedback. Then we started writing. So we have four committees uh, who are working, one on Aqaid side of it, one on Akhlaq, one on Fiqh, one on history, culture, and civilization. So when something is written, it goes to the committee, they discuss, they make comments, then the writer has to take them into consideration makes amendments, then it has to be approved, then it is converted into textbook, then goes for translation, for graphic, and then we start uh, using this, and when we get feedback, then it is printed. So, the first one, which you see now, here, and alhamdulillah you have been given a copy, is Islamic belief system. This is covering aqaid Apart from Imama, for Imama we have one independent book. For two reasons we separated Imama. One is because we wanted to discuss Imama in more details. Second is because we wanted to make this book good for Sunni and Shia together. Two of our books are for all Muslims. And three of them are for the Shia. Because sometimes we have mixed audience, you know, we have some schools, we have Sunni Shia students together. And if we teach only Shia Islam and we bring all Ahkam and Amama, everything, then the Sunni people and Sunni parents, you know, may not feel comfortable. If we remove and leave aside all important Shia doctrines, then we are losing ourselves. So we came up with this plan that those things which are common, we put them in two volumes, those things which are not common, we put them in three volumes. So in this way, nothing is missed, but at the same time, we have something to offer to all Muslims. So when it comes to Tawheed, to Nubuwa, to Ma'a, to Akhlaq, uh, we can discuss everything and our Sunni brothers can feel very comfortable. Everything out of the school of Ahlul Bayt, they feel comfortable. But when we bring Imama or Fiqh, then they become maybe uh, sensitive. So two volumes are designed in the way that they can be taught to Sunni and Shia alike. So the first is Islamic belief system. First, there is a unit, and you were given also this uh, in uh, digital format, which is only scientific. There is nothing about Quran or Hadith or Aqaid in the first unit. It's only scientific. And we thought perhaps this is what we can learn from the Quran. That Quran very much wants us to think about the greatness of creation. Not as a theological discussion. Just to know about this. Then it prepares your mind for theological discussion. So the first unit is only scientific. And people who know more science, they have better chance to get ready for the rest of the book because they know more about the greatness of this world. 
And what we plan to do beyond all this scientific information and data in the first unit is to highlight a few points. One is that there is order, there is harmony, and there is a glory and grandeur in the creation which we face. And we'll discuss it in different levels. So by reading the first unit, the mind is ready to get engaged in theological discussions about God. So the first unit is very scientific, and we are not going to uh, study this in this course because everyone can read it by himself or herself. So our main discussion starts from unit two, and that is knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or theology. So what we have here is we start with three arguments for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are more arguments, but these three are enough at this level. Argument from design or Burhan and Nazm, which inshallah we will have it uh, tonight. Argument of Wujub or Imkan, or what is known in the West, cosmological argument, and argument based on fetra or on the innate knowledge that we have about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we mentioned three arguments, and inshallah we discuss them. Then after proving existence of God, we talk about some of the major qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The quality of knowledge, the quality of power, the quality of life, and the justice and wisdom of God. And when it comes to justice and wisdom, we expand and we discuss about the problem of evil. Because many people have questions about why we have catastrophes, why we have war, we have, I don't know, uh, so many problems in the world, natural problems, moral problems. If God is knowledgeable and powerful and benevolent, why these things happen? Uh, inshallah, I will explain that indeed there is no argument against existence of God. The only thing is that they mention some examples to counter the arguments that we have for the existence of God. Otherwise, they cannot prove that God doesn't exist. They only challenge us. Say, if God exists, why these things happen? So we should be able to answer to those questions. Then we talk about some of the qualities of God, which we call them salbiyya. They are negational. For example, God has no parts, no partner. God has no body. God is not visible. Doesn't occupy any space or any time. And then we talk about relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or God and the world. God is transcendent but not far. And there is a very close relationship between God and the world. So we talk here about lordship as a very important concept, rububiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Second unit is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his existence, his attributes, and his relation with the world. Among the creatures of God, we focus on human beings. Here we have a unit which is not normally coming in the books on Aqaid, but we feel that this is very important. So about knowing man or about anthropology, we start with a discussion about human beings being a combination of body and soul. We are not only body. We have soul, and then we prove that soul is immaterial, is spiritual, and indeed it is the soul which makes our reality. So we bring some arguments to prove that soul is immaterial. Or you can say a spirit or soul. Here we use them interchangeably. Then we talk about theory of evolution. What is the scientific weight of this theory and what is the Islamic understanding of this theory? Does it contradict the fact that we are created by God or it doesn't contradict? Then we talk about some characteristics of human beings 
about human mind and reason, about human nature, about human dignity, about inclinations and desires that we have, about free will. And when we talk about free will, we talk about the issue of predestination and about decree, qaza and qadar, uh, and do qaza and qadar contradict free will or not? What is our role in planning our future? So there are very important discussions here. Then we talk about different needs that human beings have. Based on the previous discussions, when we say human beings are a um, combination of body and soul, so our needs are not only physical. We don't have only needs about body. We have needs which relate to our mind and soul. So we have physical, intellectual, spiritual needs, and we have to meet all those needs. Then we talk about human race. In Islam, all human beings are the same in humanity. We are equally human. It's not that someone is human and someone is animal, or someone is first uh, rank and first order human being, some are second. We are all equally human beings. And also, we talk about gender. Men and women are equally human. And if there are differences in their roles, in some of the regulations, some of the rulings, this is not because one is human and one is not, or one is more human, one is less human, no. In humanity, they are the same. In the potentials that they have for perfection, they are the same. Now, after knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and human beings, now we talk about the plan that Allah has for human beings and the guidance that he has provided human beings with. First, we have a discussion about guidance in general. And maybe in this way you can better see. We believe that Allah has provided all creatures with guidance. رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى When Musa and Harun were asked by Pharaoh, who is your Lord? They said, our Lord is the one who has created everything and given everything its due creation, its due guidance. Or الَّذِي خَلَّقَ فَسَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَحَدَى So everything is guided. But when it comes to human beings, we have more. In addition to the natural guidance in the form of instincts that we have, we have guidance through reason, intellect, and revelation. So we talk about reason and revelation, and then we focus on revelation. What is the definition of revelation? What are different types of revelation? How prophets received revelation? And what is the relation between reason and revelation. Do they contradict? Do they supplement each other? Do they replace each other? What is the relation between them? And then we talk about some of the characteristics of the prophets. What qualities prophets should have? In particular, we focus on their knowledge. They had a special knowledge. Their knowledge was not just conventional knowledge. They had a special type of knowledge. We will talk about their determination or willpower, which is very important. You know, among all the prophets, five are the most outstanding. And we call those five Ulul Azm, those who have determination. We don't call them Ulul Elm or Ulul Helm or Ulul Hikmah. Although they had all these qualities, but the focus is on Ulul Azm. And inshallah, we will explain why determination is so important. Then when Allah wants to refer to the most important prophets, He says these are Ulul Azm. We will talk about this. Also, we will talk about their infallibility or esma. But also, we have a discussion here about some of the prophets which are mentioned in the Quran by name, some of the books which are mentioned by name, why Allah sent different books, different messages, why we had different types of you know, rulings or sharia, what is the idea of nasr, an abrogation. So we will talk about the relation between these religions and divine codes of law and books. Then we talk about miracles or mu'jiza. The prophets had mu'jiza. And what is the definition? The technical definition of mu'jiza in chalam will be given. And then we will talk about the nature of miracles and that miracles do not uh, contradict causality. 
do not contradict any scientific you know, law or regulation. They are just beyond the normal natural laws that we know, but they are acting within their own system of cause and effect. They have their own cause and effect system. And what is the difference between miracles of the prophets and extraordinary acts of imams or saints or holy people, you know, karama? What is the difference between mu'jaza and karama? Then we focus on the prophet of Islam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So after, after talking about the prophets in general, what we call an amma we focus on the prophet of Islam. First, we have a discussion about some aspects of his personality or his character. His life will be studied in second volume. But his personality, his character will be studied here, some of major qualities of the Prophet. Then we talk about the Quran as his everlasting miracle. Why Quran cannot be uh, imitated? We talk about the eloquence of the Quran and the challenges that the Quran makes, that no one can bring something like the Quran or even like 10 chapters of the Quran or one chapter of the Quran. And then we have a discussion which is not normally discussed in the books of Aqaib, how to benefit from the Quran, how to interact with the Quran, uh, the spiritual uh, you know, in, uh, importance and significance of the Quran in Muslim life. Then we talk about seal of the prophethood, Khatman Nubuwa, why prophethood came to an end, why Allah doesn't keep sending prophets, and about successorship. But when it comes to successorship, we don't go into details. We just say after the demise of the prophet, there were different theories, Assalamu alaikum, different views, Sunni view, Shia view, so we raise the question, but those who want to answer, they should go to the books that discuss this in details. Then we have a chapter about hereafter or resurrection. And we have two arguments to prove that there must be an eternal life. We are not going to perish by death. We are surviving death. There is going to be eternal life. We bring argument from wisdom, argument from justice. Then what is the relation between this world and the hereafter? We would say that what we do in this world, we will see in the hereafter, at dunya mazra'atul akhirah. We will talk about death and about also the world between death and the day of judgment, which is barzakh. So inshallah, we will talk about uh, these different stages. And then we have a chapter which is again not discussed in the books of Aqai, but we think it's a missing you know, uh, point. And that is about salvation or felicity or happiness or sa'ad. What we want to do is we want to understand that if we follow the guidance that Allah has provided us with, what can we achieve? So this is to encourage people to follow the plan. But before giving them the plan, which is coming in the second volume, we want to say, what can they achieve? Normally we say, okay, you do these things, qurbatan ilallah. You become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what does it mean? When a person is close to Allah, what happens? We have to explain that what is the concept of nearness to Allah? Who are muqarrabun? Who are the people who are near to Allah? What type of life they have? If a community is near to Allah, what happens? If a person is near, we know. But if a community is near to Allah, what happens? So happiness for individuals, for community, in this world and the hereafter. Because we believe Islam can secure our happiness in this world as well as hereafter. Not only hereafter. It's not that in dunya we have to have miserable life then in Akhirah we are going to have happy life. If we follow Islam, we can have happy life here and the hereafter. And if we follow Islam as a community, we can have prosperous community life in this world and the hereafter. 
So in this way, the first volume finishes. So inshallah, in these days that we are together, we hope we can uh, study everything that I have said so far. Inshallah. Then we have the second volume, which is Islamic plan for life. Now we want to see what is the way to achieve this happiness. All the prophets have come to teach us what to do. So this is important. What is the plan? So it starts with a discussion about self-purification, about tazkiyat on nafs. Then we have a discussion about individual values, individual ethics. What values we have to have in every person. For example, piety. We have to be remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to be people who plan. You know, we thought that this is important to bring it into textbook. That for Muslims, planning is part of the value system that they must have. It's not mustahab or, you know, marginal. Uh, uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam said, Usikum Allah wa nazme amrakum. We should be punctual, we should plan, we should be farsighted. Uh, so we talk about planning, also we talk, uh, inshallah soon you will see, about being uh, punctual, to have order, everything within our main ethical teachings. We have to be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to be grateful, we have to rely and trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repentance, sincerity, order and punctuality, and also adornment to look nice and uh, tidy. Then about values which relate to relation between people, interpersonal values. For example, we have to observe rights of others. So from childhood we have to learn that we have to observe rights of other people. And rights of people is not only life for life or money. You know, I say, okay, I don't kill anyone and I don't touch anyone's money. No, there are many ways that we may violate rights of people. So for example, sometimes we are sitting in a car or bus and you know we have a space for two people, then one person takes 70% of the space. <laughs> so this is zulm. You have to occupy only that much which is for you. Or, you know, sometimes in the plane, you know, one person, although there is arm between the two chairs, but, you know, is coming to your side, and then you suffer. Or sometimes, you know, you go even to holy places, and we do zol. How? Someone wants to reflect, wants to contemplate. Then you start reading and reciting Quran or Dua, you know, loudly. So this disturbs. You have gone to a very holy place, you want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you are doing zulm and you are not careful. You are not a bad person, but you have not been trained and educated to observe these little, little things. Sometimes, you know, I say, you know, we should learn how to observe quietness in shrines, in the holy places, in masjid. People, you know, sometimes speak, you know, over phone, mobiles, with each other, especially when few people go together, then they want to sit in a good place, so they sit in haram, but then they discuss about everything. I think if you want to discuss, you should go to a far place, not next to Zari, or where people are praying. Or, for example, maybe you enjoy your own voice. When you recite dua, you enjoy, but not everyone enjoys listening to you. You are not, you know, necessarily a good reciter. So, you should recite very quietly. But you see people, you know, make noise, and then someone says, please say, you know, loud salawat, and others say louder, you know. Always, they make noise. I think that there must be some hours of quietness in the shrines. So you can go and just sit and relax and concentrate. So these are little, little things in which we can disregard the rights of people. 
Or, for example, inside the house. Maybe someone wants to watch, you know, this channel. Another person wants to watch that channel. So, sometimes we don't give right to other people. We don't, you know, give them any chance. So, these are small things, but zulm can be, a small can be big, but it is zulm. And always zulm is bad. You know, as Amir al Mumin said, if you give me seven continents and whatever is between them and the sky to take the peel of a barley from an ant, I don't do it. Don't say, you know, this is an ant, it's not going to make a big thing. Get all these, you know, wells of seven continents and then use it for <laughs> good purposes. Amir al says, no, zulm is zulm. وَاللَّهِ لَوْ أُعْطِيتُ الْأَقَالِيمَ السَّبْعَةِ وَمَا تَحْتَ أَفْلَاكَهَا أَلَا أَنْ أَعْسِيَ اللَّهِ فِي نَمْلَةٍ أَسْلُبُهَا جَلْبَ شَعِيرَةٍ مَا فَعَلْتُ So, when zulm is to a child or adult, is to your, I don't know, brother or your father or grandfather, it doesn't make any difference, it's zulm. Sometimes it's worse, but there is no good or safe zulm. Zulm is always destructive. So we have to learn how to observe rights of other people. And these people can be non-Muslims. Non-Muslims also have rights. You know, it's not that everyone has rights. Even in Islam, we learn that even uh, objects have rights. Water has rights. Soil has rights. Air has rights. I cannot waste them. About sympathy, about good behavior, about fulfilling vows and trustworthiness. When you promise, you have to keep your promise. You know, sometimes we think that giving a promise is a favor and keeping is an extra favor. So we give promise to people <laughs> to make them happy. Then we say, if I can, I keep it. Otherwise, at least I have made them happy. But this is not good. Giving promise is not a good thing unless your niya is to keep it. Even if you give promise to a child. The hadith says, أَحِبُّ السَّبْيَانَ وَرْحَمُوهُمْ وَإِذَا وَعَدْتُمُوهُمْ فَفُوا لَهُمْ Love children, be kind to them, and when you promise them, you have to keep your promise. Don't say, you know, it's a two years old, three years old. It doesn't make difference. When you keep promise, you give promise, you have to keep it. Then about chastity and modesty, about humbleness and benevolence and altruism. So these are the values that we should have. After that, we come to the behavior. So there are things that we should observe in our behavior. Those are values and qualities that we should equip ourselves with. So here we mention basics of Islamic behavioral system, but we don't go into details because for details, we have another book, An Ahkam. Basics of Sharia, which is a general, and Sunni Shia all accept to this level, with focus on philosophy of doing these things. So why we should you know, observe, for example, Tahara? Why we say Salat? Why we fast? Why we give Zakat? Why we have to observe certain things about food? Why we have certain rules and etiquette about mahram, na mahram, you know, this type of things. We discuss it here as the main framework. Details come in another book, inshallah, I will show you. So about prayer, about tahara, about fasting, zakat, foods and drinks, about halal meat, haram meat, animals, religious slaughter, alcohol, etiquettes of eating and drinking about narcotics and tobacco, about leisure time, music, movies, chatting, Facebook, this type of things. Then, about this social behavior. The very first thing that we discuss is about Salatul Jama'ah. Because we believe that this is a pillar in Muslim life. Salatul Jama'ah. So the role of Imam, the role of Masjid, and something about basic rules, something about history of masajid in Islam, design and architect of masajid, architecture, and imam of the masjid, what role he has, and that in every masjid there must be also some kind of religious 
a school or madrasa, you know, that masajid are place of worship, but at the same time education. Then about Friday prayer, about Hajj and Ziyarah, about interaction with the opposite gender, hijab and clothing. Then about minorities, Muslim minorities in non-Muslim land, or non-Muslim minorities in Muslim land. We should know both. Then about enjoining good and forbidding evil, about war and peace, jihad, terrorism, disarmament, nuclear war, uh, warfare, all these things uh, that relate to war and peace, and about environment, that is Islamic understanding of environment. Then we have a discussion, a unit on family. Importance of family and marriage. <coughs> then the rights and rules about relation between husband and wife, parents and children, sisters and brothers. We have three levels. Husband and wife, what relations they should have. Parents and children and sisters and brothers. So if you have everything according to Islam, then you have a Muslim family. Then about divorce. What is Islamic understanding of divorce? And why divorce is permitted but is the you know, most disliked permissible act. Then about society. How does Islam bring justice, welfare and order to society? Justice comes through judiciary system, order comes through the political system, and welfare comes through the economical system. So in a very brief and very, you know, summarized way, we talk about Islamic judiciary and political and economical system. Then, so far this is about the way Islam plans and regulates life. Here we have discussion about the way Muslims lived Islam, experienced Islam. So we have a section about culture, history, culture and civilization. If you remember in the first volume, we said we have character of the Prophet, his life comes in the second volume. So this is where we talk about the life of the Prophet. We don't talk about the lives of Imams here because the second volume is also for Sunni and Shia alike. We have another volume for the lives of Imams. But the life of the Prophet is common. So we start with the life of the Prophet before Islam, after Islam in Mecca and in Medina. Then about Islamic calendar. Major events in Islamic calendar. First, why we follow lunar calendar? Why we don't follow solar calendar? Then we talk about Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, months of Ramadan, Muharram and Ashura, because we believe Muharram and Ashura is for all Muslims. But Nimi Shaban and other occasions can be for Shia, but Muharram we think it's for all Muslims and we should promote it as an Islamic you know, thing. The birth and the Be'asa of the Prophet. Then there is a chapter about the Islamic world, how Islam spread. It was not by sword, it was by acceptance of people, about the contemporary Islamic societies, Muslim world today, and then about Islamic culture and civilizations. Here we have some important discussion. One, about scientific and cultural accomplishments of Muslims. Muslims have contributed a lot to science and civilization. Many things, you know, in mathematics, you know, in medicine, in uh, physics, are um, because of Muslims. <coughs> yes, unfortunately, Muslims didn't, you know, come forward aligned with the development of science because of some problems, internal or external problems. But this has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, so unfortunately, some people think that. If we have problems in Muslim world, it is because of Islam or because of religion. If we want to become, you know, for example, advanced, we should 
either convert to, for example, Christianity, or we should become secular, because they think West, by being, a, for example, Christian, or by abandoning religion altogether, has advanced. So there is such misconception that they think there is something wrong in Islam. But there is nothing wrong in Islam. Islam is the main reason for advancement of Muslims when they were, you know, forerunners. The problem is in Muslims and some Muslim rulers and Muslim systems and some also schools of Islam that they have very, you know, backward, you know, an awkward way of thinking. So we talk about the greatness of Islam and the decline of the Muslims. And also the difference between Islamic culture and tribal or national culture. This is a very important discussion. Sometimes we don't make distinction between Islamic culture and Arab or Iranian or Khoja or Indian or Pakistani culture. We think everything that we have is Islamic, which is not the case. Many of the things that we do is our own national or you know, tribal culture. It can be okay, but it doesn't have any Islamic significance. You can change. You can have this type of food or that type of food. As long as you observe certain rulings, it's okay. But it's not Islamic. You cannot say, you know, biryani is Islamic diet or, for example, cholo kebab is Islamic diet. You know, I was uh, just reading a few weeks ago. There is a lady who used to be with uh, uh, Imam Khomeini and uh, people, you know, there uh, in Paris before Victory of Revolution. This lady was uh, very revolutionary, so she was also there to help and also to check the parcels which were sent uh, for Imam Khomeini so that there is no you know, bomb or anything. So uh, in her interview, she said that uh, at that time, to find you know, halal meat in Paris was not easy. This is 79. And also, it was expensive. And Imam Khomeini was not happy to spend money a lot. So he said, most of the days, we were only eating eggs. For ourselves and for the guests, we were serving eggs. And there were some journalists who were going there every day. So he said, one day they asked us, can you explain what is the significance of egg in Islam? <laughs> it seems that it's a sacred you know, food. He said, no, <laughs> there is nothing. you know." A special, it's just this is cheap. You know, in Iran now, this is a, a very famous uh, food for students, university students. Most of the time, they make eggs because easy and cheap. As for Talabe, you know, he said paneer and the cheese was the most common. So, so an outsider very easily can think that e egg is Islamic, you know, way of. For example, making your food, you know, if, if they see, uh, for example, we have a special type of dress, they think this is Islamic. You see, sometimes people, you know, convert and then they start having uh, Arabic dress. Arabic dress is not necessarily the dress for all Muslims. Okay, so imagine, for example, if a bank manager becomes Muslim and from tomorrow he goes with Arabic dress, then this may create you know, some misunderstanding and maybe be discouraging other people who want to have their own dress, but they are ready to change their religion. Yes, if there is something like, for example, Imam, this type of, we think this has significance because we think this is a dress of the Prophet. But just Arabic dress, you know, we, we have many, many Arab countries with many different types of dress. And some of them are not Islamic, just cultural. So this is very important. Sometimes, you know, you see some crimes happen. You know, for example, people kill, you know, someone as a matter of honor, you know, they say, you know, but they think it's Islamic. It's not Islamic. You cannot kill your daughter if your daughter, without your permission or permission of family, you know, goes with someone. You cannot kill. Someone. It's not Islamic to kill someone because she had a relation. But 
an outsider think this is Islamic. He, they don't understand. So we have to make this distinction. You know, there is a story that uh, uh, is very f funny, but it's very true. Uh, Ayatollah Mutahari says that there was a time in Iran, people didn't have tomato. This tomato, you know, in Iran we call it goja farangi because it came from west. We didn't have tomato. So some people who were very cultural and traditional, they were against tomato because they said this is a, a foreign, you know, element coming and changing our culture. But sometimes they overreacted and for them to see someone is eating tomato was like committing a major sin. So Atullah Mutari says once a father saw his son has come home, but secretly he carried something with him to his room. So he was suspicious. And then he found that he has brought some tomato. So he was very angry. He said, you didn't say salat, I kept silent. You didn't fast, I kept silent. Now you are bringing tomato. I no longer can keep silent. You are crossing all the boundaries. <laughs> so sometimes we are so much attached to these cultural things that we are not that much attached to Islamic rulings. Even we don't notice that this is... So this is a discussion here and also about Islamic identity. What is Islamic identity? If you remove these national tribal things, then what is the thing that makes us Muslim? So this is the second volume. Then we have three volumes only for the Shia. So one is on Ahkam. It starts with explanation of Usul al-Din and Furu al-Din, principles and uh, practices. There is a good discussion about Taglid. Why we follow our Maraja, our great ulama. Unfortunately, today, people, either because they don't understand or because maybe they have some problems with some individuals or I don't know, some establishments or maybe they have some moral problems, I don't know. Anyway, there are many different types of attacks against institution of marja'iyya and against taqlid. But taqlid is the most natural thing that a person who is not expert can do. If I'm not an expert, what can I do other than following an expert? This is what we do in every field. Especially here we say someone who is expert and pious. When it comes to medicine or you know architecture or other things, you don't make it a condition that that person must be pious, but you prefer. Here we say it must be the most knowledgeable and pious. So it's very natural. So we have to help everyone understand the beauty of taqlid. And then what are the conditions of marja and how marja can be selected and what is fatwa, what is ihtiyat, what is ihtiyat mustahab, ihtiyat wajib, all these things. Then some discussions are selected about tahara, about wuzu, about ahkamul mayyit, salat, fasting, khums, zakat, amr ma'roof, also rulings about looking at mahram or na mahram, hijab, and also some rulings about tongue. Sometimes this is not discussed, or most of the time it's not discussed in uh, Rasale. Those rulings about lying, about backbiting, about accusation, about you know insulting, these are important sins that uh, may be committed without knowing the rulings of Sharia. Eating and drinking, transactions about interest, about buying and selling things which are used for haram, about gambling, about bribery. So these discussions about ahkam. Then 
we have a book on imam alhamdulillah this book is also being done half of it is done it's done in parallel with the second volume it uh, starts with the uh, uh, with a little introduction to the way shia islam started and then its history then we focus on imama what is the definition of imama why we believe in imama in general and why we believe in imam of imam ali alayhi salam in particular what are the conditions that must be there in imam what is the responsibility of imam and a very important discussion how to connect to imam first ma'rifa of imam knowing imam man mata wa lam ya'rif imam zamani mata mitatan jaliya what is knowing imam then obedience ma'rifa is the key for obedience ta'a then tawassul ziyara shafa'a all different ways that we can connect to imam in this world and the hereafter and then some of the beautiful teachings of ahlul bayt alaihim so what are we learning from imams you know, because we follow them for something so what are those things that we have actually learned from them then we focus on imam zaman imam mahdi jalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif about his character Unfortunately, there is a misconception that they think Imam Mahdi is a very kind of uh, aggressive, you know, a person who is, you know, fighting. And but Imam Mahdi is Rahmatun lil Alamin, like the Prophet. We have this title of Rahmatun lil Alamin for Imam Zaman also. He is very kind, very merciful. And like Rasulullah, he would never want to have fight. But people impose war on Imam Zaman as they imposed on Rasulullah. But his akhlaq is like Rasulullah, very kind, very merciful. Why he is in occultation? What are the traits of the time of Zuhur? And then some of the Shia beliefs that are misunderstood or some of the Shia practices that are misunderstood like Salatul, uh, for example, you know, uh, saying Salatul Zuhra and us together, or, you know, Torba, these type of things. And then, the fifth volume is Lives of Imams and Lady Fatima to Zahra, Salamu Life of the Prophet is addressed in the second volume. But Lives of Lady Fatima and Imam uh, Ali and other Imams is here. But we continue this till today. So the life of the Shia in the time of Ghaybah, highlighting the role of great ulama, will be discussed. So why, for example, we are uh, in debt to Shaykh al-Saduq, Shaykh al-Tusi, Shaykh al-Mufid, Sayyid al-Murtaba, all these great ulama. Because people should know that we haven't survived by chance. It was because of great sacrifice and leadership of our ulama. And for future also, we should do the same. If we have survived because of our ulama, we should also uh, keep following them in future. So, all together, it makes five books. And we think that these five books can be taught in two years if you have five hours per week for 36 weeks. So we planned it like this, that if you have two years and then every year you have five uh, hours per week, either you have madrasa which has five hours or for example you have a school and madrasa, so two hours in a school, three hours in madrasa. So if you have five hours and 36 weeks, you can easily handle all these five books. Islamic belief system two hours for one year, then followed by Islamic plan for life, and those other three in parallel. Ahkam, and uh, lives of Imams, and Imama in parallel for uh, two years. So altogether, it needs about 180 hours to teach it properly. 
uh, the first volume we are using now 30 hours to teach it uh, but if you want to have a class setting and you know uh, repeat have exam you know this kind of thing you need more than 30 hours you need 36 40 hours but now we are teaching in 30 hours so altogether 150 to 180 hours of teaching would cover all these five books inshallah so the first two Islamic belief system and Islamic plan for life come also with reference books so each of them is about 180 pages but the reference book is about 600 to 800 page this is for teachers now the first volume is done the reference book is done in Farsi but we have to work uh, make it English and we are working on the second so for example here remembrance of Allah is one page but then in the reference book is 10 page it's one article and some of those articles now we are publishing them separately in a spiritual quest but they are part of the book so two volumes have two reference books so those two volumes that we want to offer to all the Muslim community Shia Sunni we give them also reference books those three uh, we don't give reference books or we didn't plan it uh, for the time being maybe in future we provide those with reference books so inshallah from next year from 2014 we would start teaching also Islamic uh, plan for life and then 2015 Imama also comes and then gradually the other two also what we want to do is to have teacher training so either in their own town or if they want to come to home we train the teachers if they want we send them exam papers if they want we can mark and give certificate so everything to support the family but as much as they need if they say we need just the books here you are if they say you know we need teacher training here you are everything that they need just to be available for them and there are families who live in a small towns they don't have community they don't have madrasa so we should also make it available as multimedia you know packages everything recorded so it's available for them so inshallah with your dua we hope that in a matter of maybe two years then we have all these five books and two reference books inshallah everything ready in english but also it should be translated into other languages then after that either we go to university level or we come down to the madrasa level at the moment we don't want to go to madrasa level because alhamdulillah there are some initiatives and we hope they flourish and they meet the need so we don't want to duplicate uh, we go to the university level prepare textbooks for university students inshallah okay we should maybe have a break and inshallah after break we start with the uh, unit two uh, about how to prove existence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا رحمن الرحيم This hadith is from أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام and it is in Bihar al-Anwar, volume 10, page 186. Amir al says, Al-ilmu afdhalu min al-mal bisaba'ah. Knowledge is better than money because of seven reasons. Uh, this is one of the topics that we always you know, discuss. Is knowledge better or money? And we all say knowledge is better, but then we go after money. <laughs> so we know the answer, but uh, we don't necessarily act properly. And uh, inshallah, you will yourself realize when we say knowledge, what we mean by knowledge. The hadith itself makes it clear that what type of knowledge is meant here. 
Al-awwal. The first reason why knowledge is better than money is that annahu mirathul anbiya wal mal mirathul fara'ina. Knowledge is legacy or inheritance of prophets. What can you learn and inherit from prophets? Knowledge. And this is why we have hadith al ulama o varathatul anbiya. Ulama inherit from prophets. But mal is something that you inherit from people like Pharaoh. Pharaoh doesn't leave behind you know knowledge or wisdom or you know any good quality. The maximum that he leaves behind is a big palace, I don't know, jewelry, treasure, house, something like this. So what do you want to inherit? You want to inherit knowledge from the prophets or you want to inherit money from the people who were after dunya and they only accumulated money. Athani, the second reason why knowledge is more important is al ilmu la yanqusu bin nafaqah wal mal yanqusu biha knowledge is not reduced by using and spending and expenditure if you have knowledge and you use it in two ways acting upon it and teaching it's not reduced. Indeed, it becomes more and more uh, established and more and more powerful. If you share your knowledge with people, you teach people, you act upon your knowledge, you reflect upon it, it becomes even better and better. But money, whether you spend it on yourself or you give it to other people, that money is reduced. So it's better to invest on something that is never reduced. And the more you use it, the more you have. Athalith Yahtajul Mal Ilal Hafiz Wal Ilm Yahfadu Sahiba. Money needs guard, security, police, insurance. You have to Find a way to protect your money. And always you are worried. What is going to happen to my money? And the maximum you can protect your money is also when you are alive. When you die, you cannot take your money with you, as we will say, inshallah, later. So there is a limited amount of protection that you can have, but with lots of headache. But knowledge is... Not in need of protection. Indeed, knowledge protects you. No thief can come and rob your knowledge. You don't need to put your knowledge in bank or you know, in safe. Knowledge is there and is safe. And indeed, knowledge protects you from many problems. ar This is very beautiful. Al ilmu yadhulu fil kafan wa yabqa al mal. When you die, you cannot take your money with you, but you can take your knowledge with you. Money you have to leave it behind. Even if they put your money inside the grave, it's not coming with you to your barzakh. You know, in the past, there were people who were buried with lots of jewelries, and you know, even sometimes they buried the horse next to them, so that when they are resurrected, they have a horse ready. <laughs> These are not going to help at all. If your children don't use your money and say, you know, we don't want to use, we want to remain for father, Still, you cannot benefit. So whether they use it or don't use it, whether they bury it with you or not, it's not going to help you. But knowledge is going to help you. But 
from here you understand that this knowledge means the knowledge which has made you a better person. A knowledge which has made you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a knowledge is irrelevant to your character, or it is relevant, but you have not acted upon that knowledge, you have not absorbed that knowledge, it's not beneficial. Okay? So, if I know something, but whether I know it or not, doesn't affect my personality. This is not the knowledge that helps me in my life after death. Or if something is related, like even knowledge of religion, or knowledge of akhlaq, but it is just in my mind, not in my heart. I have memorized it. This is not helpful. It has to be absorbed. It has to be something that makes me a better person. So knowledge comes with you in your grave, in your kafan. It means that it is giving you company, but money, no. Al-Khamis, Al-Mal Yahsul Lil-Mu'min Wal-Kafir. Money can be achieved or obtained by believer or unbeliever. You cannot say the one who has money is necessarily a believer because non-believers also can have money. Indeed, according to the Quran, we understand that non-believers, they have get, uh, you know, better chance and more opportunity to become rich because of several reasons. One is that because they don't have anything else. So if Allah wants to give them something, he gives them in dunya. So he gives them money. There is no other account that they have. So if they want to receive anything, Allah will give them in dunya. And also because dunya is the least important thing. So when Allah wants to give something uh, to someone which is not important, he gives him money. If he wants to give something which is important, he gives him knowledge, wisdom, iman. A spiritual gifts are more important. So they are given much more you know, uh, difficult than money. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that had it not been that mu'mineen would have lost their iman, he would have given kuffar so much that they could make their houses from gold. Their roof, the buyutahim suqufan min fizza, or from silver. They could make it from silver. So money is not important. If you ask Allah for a good car or house, you can get it more easily than asking for presence of heart in the Salat. If you ask Allah for a partner, good partner in business, you get it much more easily than asking for a good husband or wife. This is partner in your spiritual life. So money is not important, but knowledge. True knowledge, which is nur, al-almunurun. That true knowledge is only possible to achieve when you are mu'min. Al-almunurun yaqzafuhullah fi qalb man yasha. So this makes it clear that this knowledge is not knowledge that you learn in a school or university. This is the knowledge that comes in heart. As-sadis. Jami'u al-nas yahtajuna ila sahib al-ilm fi amr al-deenahim. Wala yahtajuna ila sahib al-mal. Everyone is in need of ulama. Pious, true ulama. When it comes to their religious life, religious matters, they need ulama. But they may not necessarily need rich people. Maybe in all my life, I don't have any meeting with a rich person. I never have seen or met a billionaire. I don't need. But everyone is in need of benefiting from true ulama. 
there is a hadith which says that if you see ulama visiting the kings and rulers, so bi'sal ulama wa bi'sal umara, what a bad ulama they are and what bad rulers they are, that they let ulama visit them. It must be opposite. When you see people who have power and money, they visit ulama, this is a good sign. But if you see it's opposite, ulama are visiting the people who are rich because they are rich, this is a problem. as the last one. Al-ilmu yuqaddir rajul ala al-murura ala al-sirat wal-mal yamna'uhu Every one of us must cross hell by going on sirat because sirat is on top of hell. Allah says in min kumilla wa all will be exposed to hell. If we fall down, then we go to hell. So we have to cross by walking or running, depending on how fast you will be, or crawling <laughs> on sarat. Knowledge helps you. Knowledge gives you a strength. But money not only doesn't help you, it stops you. Al-mal yamna'uhu. Because it's like carrying lots of weight. You know, if you want to run, but 20, 30, 40 kilograms of weight are in your, I don't know, dress or on your back, then you cannot run. If you have a plane with lots of passengers and, you know, lots of, you know, luggage, then it's very difficult. Sometimes, you know, there, are, you know, there is crash. You know, recently, you know, a few years ago, there was a plane uh, that as soon as it uh, uh, went to the air, it crashed because so much of weight. They didn't, you know, observe, you know, the limit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, مَا لَكُمْ إِثَّاغَلْتُمْ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ Why you are attached to the earth? So much weight you have taken, then you cannot fly. <coughs> so, mal is d- difficult. Hadi- there is a hadith which says, the last prophet who goes to heaven is whom? Prophet Sulaiman. The last prophet, because he had a kingdom that no one had after him. Habli mulkan la yanbagi le ahadin man badi. He asked Allah to give me a kingdom that no one would have it after me. Okay, now this is the cost. You have to make sure that everyone goes to heaven, then you go. Not because he had problems, na'uzubillah, or he had sins. No. This is the outcome. Those who have less. They can go faster. Okay? So, Al-ilmu yuqadbir rajul ala al-murura ala al-sirat wal-malu yamna'uh. So, these are seven reasons why knowledge is more important than money. Of course, <coughs> this is true knowledge, not knowledge which is just a matter of learning few concepts because that can become a problem if knowledge is not practiced it becomes a whale al-ilmuhu wal hijab akbar okay so if there is an alim who doesn't practice this knowledge is destructive yughfar lil jahil sab'una dhanban qabla an yughfar lil alim dhanbun wahid if a person is ignorant or is not educated 70 sins can be forgiven before one sin of alam is forgiven. Okay? So I'm not saying every alam is uh, important. But those who have true ilm, those who have this uh, knowledge which has made them a better human being, closer to Allah, this is what they achieve. And those who are after money, because sometimes there are people who are not after money. Money is after them. It's not that they forgotten everything and they have become rich. 
they are very religious people, very kind people, very helpful. But whatever they do, it just adds to their money. Allah gives them more. This is not bad. What is important is to be attached. If to, you are attached to money, is very bad. Uh, there is hadith which says, لَيْسَ الزُّهْدُ أَلَّا تَمْلِكَ شَيْئًا بَلَ الزُّهْدُ أَلَّا يَمْلِكَ كَشَيْءٍ Zuhd is not not to own. Zuhd is not to be owned. Sometimes I have a very old car and still I am concerned. Sometimes I have a very new car and I am not concerned. I can park it anywhere. But there are people that when they park their car, they are always concerned. During Salat, you know, after Salat, during lecture, what is happening to my car? You know, they're always concerned. So this is important. Okay, now let us go to our discussion about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Please, please. Is this the same hadith which appeared in Nahjul Balagha, advice given to Sumer ibn Ziyad? Is that the same seven hadith during the... No, that is the... Sumer ibn Ziyad yes, yes. about the Ulu. Yeah. No, it's not exactly the same. No, no. That is also about El, but it's different. Yes. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Here what we want to do is, first we want to prove existence of God. Before we mention arguments for the existence of God, I should say that in the Quran and also in the Bible, the focus is not on proving the existence of God. The focus is on correcting people's understanding of God. If you look at the Quran, we have many, many verses about Tawheed. Unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have many verses about knowledge of God, about mercy of God. We have very few verses about proving the existence of God. Why? Because to believe in God is not complicated. Quran says, Is there any doubt about Allah who is the creator of the skies and the earth? How can you doubt? This cannot be by chance. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am khulqu min ghayra shay'in am humul khaliqun. Are they created from nothing or they have created themselves? You cannot say I am created from nothing because nothing cannot create you. You cannot say I have created myself. So you should have a creator. Okay, so Quran brings very brief, simple arguments, but doesn't very much go into details. Why? Because people, as inshallah we will explain, naturally tend to believe in God. The problem that pagans had in the time of Jahiliya before Islam was not atheism, was polytheism. The problem was not that they didn't believe in God. The problem was that they believed in God, but they believed also in many idols. But even those idol worshippers, they believed in one creator. لَإِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ even those who were worshipping Lot and Uzzah and Hubal, if you ask them who has created the skies and the earth, they wouldn't say Lot and Hubal. They say Allah. So there's only one creator. They knew. Even those people knew this. Then the question was, why then you worship this? If they have not created us, if they have not created anything, why we worship this? وَمَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرَّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ we only worship them because we want to get close to Allah. So they thought 
that by worshiping these idols, they can get closer to the Creator. Why? They didn't have any good answer for this. Yes. Who? Uh, our understanding, yes. This is very delicate point. We don't say Allah created the world from nothing. We say Allah created the world not from anything. <laughs> Lady Fatima Salamullah alayha said, خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْأَشْيَا لَا مِنْ شَيْءَ Not مِنْ لَا شَيْءَ If you say مِنْ لَا شَيْءَ is wrong. Allah created the world from nothing. So it means that nothing has become like a material. And nothing is not a material. Lady Fatima said لَا مِنْ شَيْءَ means not from anything. So the big difference between saying from nothing or saying not from anything. So we believe Allah created the world without having any matter or any material to use. There was nothing to be used. Okay? So, the pagans had this problem that they believed in God as creator, but they suffered from shirk, polytheism. And this is why when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa started his mission, he didn't need to talk about existence of God. He focused on Tawheed. Qulu la ilaha illallah tuflahu. Say. But this say means believe. It doesn't mean just say and you know, do what you want. Qulu means believe, maintain. There is no God, but the only one God, you become happy. Unity of God is solving all problems. Inshallah, later we will talk about Tawheed. So, the focus of Quran, the focus of the Prophet of Islam, and the focus of previous Prophets, mostly was on having a good understanding of God. Not proving existence. Because proving existence of God was not needed. They already believed in God. Later, when people came to know more about some philosophical ideas coming from Greeks, you know, when the Greek works were translated, you know, some ideas came to the Muslim world and then people like Ibn Abel Oja and other people, you know, they were atheists. And we have, you know, for example, hadith that Imam Sadiq salam had discussion with them about proving existence of God. But these are new. In the time of Rasulullah, this was not that much uh, the topic to prove the existence of God. In any case, whether this is something that was the focus or not, whether you yourself are convinced or not, we believe that every Muslim should be able to argue for the principles of faith, including the existence of God. So, you may not have any doubt, but still it's good to learn how to argue for the existence of God. Because in this way, first, you can make sure that no one can question and, you know, shake your faith. And also you can share this with other people. So it's not bad to discuss arguments. For example. Don't say, you know, our iman is strong. We don't need, you know, yes, our iman is strong, but there is no problem. We have to learn. Our ulama always say that when it comes to aqa'id, you cannot do taqlid. In aqa'id, basic of aqa'id, details, yes. But in basic, you have to have your own way of arguing. I cannot say I believe in Tawheed because my alim says this, or my mother says this, or my father says this. When it comes to 
Tawheed, when it comes to the Prophet of Islam, when it comes to Quran, you have to be able to have something to back up your faith. You have heard this hadith that once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saw an old lady. She was using a sewing machine or, you know, a machine for making thread. And Rasulullah said, how do you come to know, how did you come to know about God? She said, when I move the handle of this machine, it works. When I stop, it doesn't work. So there must be a mover, otherwise this doesn't work. For the same reason, there must be a mover for this world who gives motion to these stars and your know, planets. Otherwise, there is no motion. Rasulullah said, Alaykum bedin al ajais. You should have your religion like this old lady. This old lady. Some people misunderstand. That means that, like old ladies who don't go to a school, who don't learn anything, you should be like them. Don't discuss about religion. You know, there were people from other schools of Islam who were discouraging people to study kalam and philosophy. They said, you shouldn't study kalam or theology. This is bedah. There is a famous example that once a person asked one of the famous people, I don't want to mention the name, he asked him, what does it mean, ar-Rahman al arsh istawa he said, al istawa o ma'loom. The meaning, literal meaning of istawa is known. Istawa means to stand on something. Wal kayfu majhul. But the quality of this in the case of Allah standing on ash and throne is not known. Al istawa o ma'loom. Wal kayfu majhul. Was su'alu bid'ah. But why you ask this question? This is heresy. No one asked this question in the time of Rasulullah. So why you are you asking this question? So everyone who was asking a deep question, they were saying this is bid'ah. Logic is bid'ah. Kalam is bid'ah. Falsafa is bid'ah. Okay? This was their mentality. And unfortunately, this created lots of problems. But in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we are different. In the school of Ahlul Bayt, we say asking is not a bad asking is obligation. You have to ask. Or answers, Fasalu Ahlul Zikr in Kuntum La Ta'alama. If you don't know, you must ask. There is no problem. Even our Imams used to teach Shia that whenever we tell you something, ask for reference. If we t tell you make wuzu in this way or salat in that way, anything, ask for reference. They wanted them to learn, to ask, so that then they can later teach other people. Yes. Yes. Ahlul Dhikr is general. In some hadith, it is taken to refer to the people who have knowledge of the divine books. In some hadith, it is taken to refer to Ahlul Bayt. But these are just giving you examples. These are not limiting the meaning. Everyone who has knowledge of something, when you don't know, you ask him. In the first place, prophets and Ahlul Bayt. But in the second place, any alim. So when you have these uh, hadiths which says that this ayah refers, for example, to this person or this group, it doesn't mean necessarily that it is limiting the meaning. For example, if hadith says, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna refers to Imam Hussein. It doesn't mean that it is only Imam Hussein. It means this is one of the best examples. Otherwise, it can refer to other people who had this confident soul. So Ahl al-Dhikr is everyone who has knowledge of uh, 
religion, knowledge of revelation, and Aleph. So we don't have any problem with asking questions. But asking questions has some etiquettes. We shouldn't ask questions for troubling ulama. You know, sometimes there are people who know some few mas'aleh. When an alim goes to the community, they ask him to put him into corner and put him on a spot. You know, this is not good. Ask Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said in the hadith of Anwan al-Basri, Iyyaka wa an tas'ala al-ulama ta'annutan. Don't ask them to trouble them. Ask for the sake of learning and understanding. I was in Germany a uh, few months ago, and there was a conference. A lady uh, univer uh, from University of Berlin, she was a nice lady, but she made this point. She said, in the Quran, asking question is taken to be bad. We were surprised, you know, why she said this. Then she mentioned the story of Prophet Musa and Khizr. She said, Khizr is telling Musa, you shouldn't ask questions. You should keep silent. Then I made this comment. I said, indeed, the Quran encourages us to ask questions. The Quran said, you must ask questions. Fas'alu. And the problem of Musa and Khizr was not that why Musa asked questions. The problem was he was supposed to wait till Khizr himself explains for him. It's like, for example, I am giving a lecture, for example, I'm on member. I say, you know, please wait till I come down from member. Then you can ask your question. Because member is different from class. In class, you can always ask questions, but member is different. So there are some etiquettes to observe. Otherwise, we don't have any problem. And Musa later himself was taught by Khizr why he did all those things. So this is a conception that some people have, that they think you shouldn't ask questions. Even when Allah says, لا يسألوا عما يفعل وهم يسألون Allah is not asked, is not questioned, but everyone else is asked. Some people misunderstand this. They, they think that because Allah is very powerful and, you know, very much in control of everything, he doesn't let anyone to ask him. You don't ask me anything. No, this is not the meaning of la yus'alu amma yuf'al. La yus'alu amma, yaf, yuf, amma yaf'al means because he himself observes all the necessary requirements, observes all the moral standards, there is no need to ask him. If someone is 100% observing moral values, we don't need to ask him. We don't ask also angels. Not only we don't ask Allah, there is no questioning for angels. Because angels always do good things. It is only human beings that they may act properly or may not, therefore they have to be judged and questioned. Otherwise, if you mean by asking, asking for the sake of understanding, Allah lets you ask. He let angels to ask. When they say, Ataj alo fiha man yufsidu fiha wa dama, he said, You have to know everything so that you can understand. Then he created a very beautiful scenario so that they understand the answer. عَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ فَقَالَ أَنْبِئُونِي بِأَسْمَاءِهَا أُولَاءٍ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ قَالُوا سُبْحَانَكَ لَا إِلْمَ لَنَا إِلَّا مَا عَلَّمْتَنَا Then Allah said, أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So everything was planned so that they come to know that there are something that Allah knew and they didn't know. So Allah didn't say, you know, you must not ask any question, just do what I tell you. So, even when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can ask questions. But for the sake of understanding, not for the sake of objecting, because there is no way to object his decision. If I object Allah, it means that I am confused. Yes. If 
you ask for this question, this lady yeah. seems to respond. Yeah. What does this mean? This is one of the etiquettes that we have to observe. Allah says, لا تسألوا أن أشياء إن تبدلكم تسوكم. There are things that you shouldn't ask. For example, I shouldn't ask you, did this brother say something about me when I was not here? This is not a good question. Because even if he has said this, you should keep it hidden from him. You know? So, uh -huh. there are things, yeah. لا تسألوا أن أشياء Don't ask of things that if they are known to you, they will trouble you. Or for example, if I ask, when am I going to die? And then if I am told next month, then I cannot function properly. So there are things that we shouldn't know. And we shouldn't try to know. But asking for the sake of asking is not a problem if you want to learn and observe the etiquettes. Okay, so it's absolutely good to discuss about existence of God. And we don't have any red line here, you know, we can discuss here with full freedom. Yes. They are also included. Yeah. They are also included, but the best examples are Ahlul Bayt. Yes. Okay, the first argument that we have here is Burhan and Nazm, or what is known in the West as argument from design. Okay? Many people have discussed this, you know, even. People like Plato, they have discussed this. In medieval ages, people like Augustine, like St. Thomas Aquinas, they have discussed this argument. Among Muslim theologians, philosophers, many people have discussed this. Kendi, Baghilani, Ghazali, Fakhr Razi, all have discussed this argument. And among our contemporary ulama, Ayatollah Mutahari, Ayatollah Jawadi Amudi, Ayatollah Subhani, in their books, they have referred to this argument. Some people think that this argument is not strong. They have criticized, but uh, our ulama have answered to those questions. First, let us explain what does this mean, that there is design or there is nazm, there is order. There are three versions of this argument and we can use all the three together sometimes we refer to the fact that there is purpose when you look at this world you find that there are things which are created but they have a purpose they have end to reach Nothing is created here in vain. If you look at, for example, animals, you see that they have a journey in front of them, which is planned for them, and they naturally move towards their end. Yes, maybe one animal dies in the process, or is killed, but, but it, it doesn't mean that there is no line which is taking them to their end. So from the time that they are born till they grow and then they die, there is a very clear passage, there is a very clear road or you know, journey in front of them. In the first units, some of these things are mentioned. For example, how some types of fish, when they want to lay eggs, they swim against the current and go where they themselves were born, which is very difficult. Sometimes they go to the height so that they reach the point which is suitable for laying the eggs. And they may die themselves. 
how they make their nests, the birds, you know, how they make their nests, how they navigate, how butterflies use corridors. In the book, you know, it's mentioned that sometimes they use corridors and therefore they can travel faster. Because they know that this, for example, uh, is where wings come and they can use it. So there are many, many ways that animals, birds, insects, you know, about, for example, ant, about bees, how they have a very clearly defined purpose in what they are doing. <coughs> yes, something which is different between animals and us, and inshallah we will explain also in Fetra. Maybe they don't do these things consciously. The difference between human beings and animals is that they may do things without knowing what they are doing, without knowing that they have this type of knowledge. You know, they do it naturally, by instinct. If you ask a bird, could you please explain how you make a nest? The bird cannot explain. You know, they just know how to do it. But there is no articulation, there is no theory behind it. You know, sometimes I say this example. I say, you know, if a cat sees a mouse, knows that this is good and delicious and is a good food, and goes after the mouse. <coughs> but no cat has universal <coughs> concept about mouse. That what is the nature of mouse, what, you know, mouse uh, is doing, what is the, for example, nutrition that they use, how can, you know, for example, we better hunt them. They don't have this kind of general universal knowledge about them. So they don't have anything like massology. Okay? They just do it automatically. They have never, you know, developed a science about this. Or birds, they know how to make nests, but they have never developed a technology or science. And this is why you see the way they make the nest today or they made 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago is the same. They never reflect on what they do. Okay? This is why they don't make progress. Like some of the third world countries. <laughs> that they never reflect on what they do and they never progress. But we as human beings are supposed to always reflect on what we do, why we do, how we do it. Maybe we can improve. Okay, so I don't want to say they have this type of knowledge that we have. But they have some type of guidance that they go after their own end. If you put seed of a flower into the soil, that seed knows how to become a flower. It's not that that seed, you know, is confused or, you know, doesn't know, you know, get stuck, you know, I am not told what to become. Can you tell me, you know, what I have to become? Shall I become, I don't know, for example, uh, this type of flower or that type of flower? Everything is programmed, is planned, it has knowledge. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَعْتَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ حَدَى So this purpose is one sign of design. Another thing is, another dimension of design is that everything in this world has a very sophisticated structure in itself, apart from purpose and end by itself. The way it is created and the way it can function. For example, if you look at human eyes, okay, I don't need to go after anything else. Just what we have in our own body is enough. How carefully this eye is created that it can function. Even maybe 
today what we know is much less than what we don't know about the way eye is functioning. Our kidney, I don't know, our stomach, our heart, our brain. If you look at animals, if you look at even uh, a small, you know, insects. Just, you know, for example, if you look at a, a f mosquito or fly. If we see, uh, for example, a helicopter, we think it's very sophisticated. Yes, it is sophisticated, but compared to a fly or mosquito, is nothing. Because this fly is self-sufficient. It doesn't need anyone, a pilot, of any, I don't know, control tower, any petrol, mm -hmm. any discipline. It functions by itself. It moves around, goes everywhere, knows what to eat, <laughs> what not to eat, what to do, how to protect itself. So it's much more complicated. Just one fly is much more complicated than our uh, airplanes and helicopters. <coughs> Still today you cannot create a fly. <coughs> Even if we create something, we use the things which Allah has created. You know, sometimes people say we can clone a, a human beings. Cloning is not a sign that you are creator because you are using the things that Allah has created and the regulations that he has put in this world. If you can create something not from anything, then you can be saying that I am a creator. But if you are using something that is Allah, is created by Allah, then especially about life, we always use living things to create another living thing. But something which is totally dead, we cannot give it life. We don't have this ability to give life. So, the second aspect of design is the sophisticated structure that is there in creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Birds, animals, human beings, organs that we have, water, you know, just water by itself is magnificent. Just think about water. How this water is made in the way that it can take different forms and shapes, but at the same time remains the same substance. And how beautiful is the structure of water and how, you know, just a few days ago I saw a very beautiful picture about water. Uh, you know, if you use, you know, some uh, microscopes, you know, the very beautiful design in water. So this is the second aspect. The third aspect is a harmony of all these beings, harmony that exists in the whole world. So it's not that only we have sophisticated beings. No, we have a whole universe in which everything interacts with other things. There is no gap, there is no separation. It's not that we have two or three or ten different worlds that they don't have any interaction with each other. Everything in this world is in touch, is in counter with other things and the design is in the way that you don't see any separation, you don't see any vacuum, you don't see any gap. If these, you know, stars and planets that we see, if they were not following very carefully planned movements, we could have not had any stability. They are so carefully designed that even today scientists can tell us that, for example, 10,000 years ago at this time there was eclipse. Or after 10,000 years ago, uh, later, there is going to be such a natural event. Everything is very carefully planned. 
if the movement of Earth around Sun was faster or was more slowly, then we couldn't have this type of life that we have. The, if it was more slowly, we would have become all frozen. If it was faster, it would be so hot and also we would feel, not feel comfortable. The, sp the speed, the pace is so nice that you, we don't feel we are moving. It's like a cradle as Allah says, جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مَحْدَ You know, if you put your child in the cradle and move too fast or too slow, it's not useful. A very careful, you know, uh, speed is needed so that feels comfortable and sleeps. So, having end and purpose, having sophisticated structure and harmony that we have in the whole world, show that this world cannot be created by chance. Imagine you go to a desert and you see not this huge world, only you see a building. You see only a car. Can you ever accept that this was because of some flood that brought all these, you know, bricks and plasters and metal and then made this building? If we don't accept that even one building can be created by chance, by accident, how can we believe that human body is created by chance? And how can we believe that all these stars and planets are created by chance? Unfortunately, because we are used to seeing these things always, we take them for granted. <coughs> we don't think these are special. But these are much, much more magnificent than human creature. When it comes to human creature, we give it lots of you know, importance. But when we see all these magnificent things, then we take them for granted. If there is a typing machine, okay, and there is a page on which few couplets of poem are typed. For example, something from Rumi or, you know, by Rumi or Saadi or Hafiz or I don't know, Goethe or anyone, Shakespeare. Just few lines. We never think that this can be done by a child who was playing with this uh, typing machine and by chance it became this beautiful poem. You see, th this must be done by someone who knew these letters, was educated, knew how to type. The chance of having few lines typed by a child is something that we never accept to be reality. What about the whole universe? Even if you say that there is a chance, this chance is not considerable. The possibility of having all these combinations in the way that we want is not considerable. You know, if you have, a, say, for example, a box, and in that box you have 10, for example, mm, I don't know, like 10 coins, for example. For example, you know, one pence, I don't know, two pence, five pence, ten pence, so on and so forth. And without looking into the box, you bring one coin. The chance is one in ten to be the one that you want. But if you want the second time also the same coin come, the chance is one in hundred. Okay, it's not again one in ten. If you want to put your hand in this box and three successive times the same coin comes out, this is one in thousand. 
Okay? So, to think that someone has put his hand in this, for example, box, and always by chance this coin has come, when it reaches, you know, 100 times, it's something that even a uh, computer you know, takes time to calculate. The chance of a child pressing one button by chance is 1 in 28, for example, if you have 28 letters. But the second time choosing the correct letter, the correct button, is 28 in 28. So when it comes to a line, you know, it's so big that we cannot, you know, imagine. So how can we say that one page is possibly typed by child? It's impossible. Yes, mathematically, there is a possibility, mathematically. But that possibility is so low that no rational person would ever think. So sometimes probability is so low, it's like epsilon, which is nearly zero. That no rational person think that this is by chance. How can this whole universe, forget universe, just human body, how can this be by chance? If one page, you know, we don't accept to be by accident, how can human body be by accident? It's impossible. So this argument from design is a very good argument because it is something that every person, even if he is not a scientist, can understand. But those who have more knowledge, those who have more you know, experience, those who are scientists, they can better appreciate. We have always had scientists who were believers in God. You know, sometimes people say there are scientists who don't believe in God. Okay, that's not a problem. The fact that there are scientists who are believers in God is important because you can always have confused people. But we have great top scientists in the book, the name of some of them are mentioned. Top scientists who have been believers in God. Yes, maybe sometimes a person has a question, is not able to answer when he becomes atheist. That is not causing a, any problem. The people who have great knowledge, people like, you know, Newton, like Einstein, all these people were religious people. Even, inshallah, you'll talk about, for example, Darwin and his theory. Darwin was a religious person. Even at the time he was uh, becoming a priest. He was not an atheist. Yes, the teachings, traditional teachings of the church was not compatible with his idea, but he was a believer in God. Galileo was a believer in God. It's not that he was, but he didn't accept the idea of the church. So, there have been many, many scientists, and today, you know, we have many, many Muslim scientists, Christian scientists, Jewish scientists who believe in God. Indeed, we expect scientists to be more religious because they know more about the greatness of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the argument from design. One thing about argument from design is that also at the same time that it proves existence of God, it proves knowledge of God. Because we are using this argument to show that there must be a designer and designer cannot be ignorant. You cannot create this magnificent world without knowledge. <coughs> he must have at least enough knowledge to plan all these things. This argument maybe doesn't prove that his knowledge is unlimited. He, but he proves that he has so much knowledge that he knows everything that even we, after thousands of years, we don't know. You know, if you ask any scientist, physicist, chemist, biologist, any scientist, have you known everything in your field? They say no. 
has the percentage of questions become less? They said no. The more we know, the more questions we have. Millions of people are studying physics, chemistry, biology throughout the centuries. Still, they haven't reached the point that they can say we know more than we don't know. So, the one who has designed this world must have magnificent amount of knowledge. I'm not saying philosophically unlimited. Argument from design cannot prove unlimited knowledge. For that, we use other arguments. But we don't need to prove unlimited knowledge. This is enough for us. He has enough knowledge to design all these things. Okay? It also shows the power of God. Because if he had knowledge, but he didn't have power to put into reality what he knew, then it was not functioning. So not only God has knowledge, he has power to create the things according to his knowledge. You know, sometimes you have an idea, but you cannot give it a reality. Sometimes a person says, you know, I know that we can make a car which is very fast, you know, but I am not able to produce it, to make it. So he has knowledge, he has power, and this is the beauty of argument from design, that not only proves the existence of God, it also proves some of his qualities. The only thing that I think stops some people really believing in the argument from design is one of the two. Either sometimes they refer to some disorders in the world and then they question. They say sometimes there is earthquake, sometimes there is, I don't know, flood. So this shows that there is no design. This is wrong. Indeed, if you know how an earthquake happens, you know that this is also according to design. This has its own very carefully decided laws. It doesn't happen by chance, by accident. It's part of the design. You know, for example, if we get sometimes cold, or flu. This doesn't mean that there is no design. No, human body has very uh, sophisticated design, but certain viruses or germs or bad food can affect us. This doesn't mean there is no design. Indeed, there is design, and if you learn, then you can prevent or you can treat people. It's not because here there was no design, there was no regulation, it happened by chance or accident. Why scientists never give up? They always want to understand more and more. Why, for example, doctors don't say, you know, cancer cannot be treated? Because all of them know that everything in this world has a reason, has a cause. And we can try to find out and prevent it or you know, if it happens to treat it <coughs> there is nothing which is in this world happening by chance or accident if scientists had this idea that things happen by ch chance then they should have closed their laboratories and you know say we don't do anything because things happen by chance <laughs> yeah if in a country those who are in power make decisions, you know, by chance. Then as scholars, you know, say, and experts, they say, we should, you know, close everything. Because people decide by chance. Universities all should close down. Because in that country, people who have power, they don't listen to anyone. But this is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does everything according to rules and regulations and this is why everyone is motivated to find out the system if allah was acting without any you know design without any planning then all the scientists said we should close because we don't know what is happening today sun comes from east tomorrow may come from west another day from north 
We cannot predict anything. Everything we try to understand so that we can predict, we can plan. We know that, for example, there is a system we need a special, for example, a speed. If we want to send, for example, a missile, for example, to another part of what type of a speed it should have, how we should plan it. Because we, deep in our mind, we know that this world is the world of rules and regulations. You just need to know. Then you can use in your benefit and in your interest. So, one problem is that sometimes people look at the disorders and they think there is no design. But these disorders are disorders when you look at them in a very small scale. If you look at them from above, you see this is not disorder. Indeed, this is also an order. <laughs> yeah? Another problem is that we are used to the beautiful creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we unfortunately take it very simple. When you wake up in the morning and you have no problem, you have no headache, no problem, you take it easy. When you have your food and you don't have any pain in your stomach, you take it easy. But if this happens to you, that every day you wake up, you have headache, and then one day you don't have headache, say, Alhamdulillah, today I didn't have headache. Every time I have food, I have pain. Today, Alhamdulillah, I didn't have pain. So when something happens for you all the time, you take it for granted. You never thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. <coughs> Only must something big happens that we think this is Allah's help. You know, if I go in front of, for example, a car and then all of a sudden the driver, you know, stops and I'm not killed, I think it's a mu'jizah. But every day lots of mu'jizah is happening around us. We just don't see. I think the fact that now we are sitting here is mu'jizah. So many problems could have happened to us uh, stopping us meeting here. Yeah, mu'jizah is not, you know, someone coming from another, you know, planet, you know, telling something strange to us. All the things that happen are mu'jizah. When you drink water, this is mu'jizah. How this water goes in the way that uh, still you can breathe, you don't get suffocated. It's mu'jizah. How can your body use this water? And also, if there is something extra, get rid of it. It's mu'jizah. The late Elahi Qumshay, who was a great alim, poet, he also translated Quran and uh, Mafati. One of my teachers said that he used to look at flowers and cry. Looking at a rose flower was enough for him to cry. Why? Because he was seeing the beauty of this flower. Me and you, when we look at this flower, it's normal for us. But an Arif, when he looks at this flower, it is moving him. You know, sometimes, you know, there are people who spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for one painting. If they give me 50 pounds, I don't buy. So it's nothing, you know. But the one who is expert, the one who is an artist, he says this is worth tens of thousands of pounds. Sometimes they say we cannot put any value on this. Because they know the value. For me, I don't have any special appreciation of this. Even if you give me free, you know, I don't use it. There is a, a beautiful story that once a person gave a ring to someone and said, go to the market of those who sell iron and ask how much they buy. 
you know, in the past they had markets for different goods. So there was one market for the people who use, uh, who sell perfume, another for example, uh, I don't know, commodity, uh, jewelry, they had different markets. So he took this ring to the market for the sellers of iron. And then he came back, went back and said, only one dirham. Then he said, now take it to the market of those who sell jewelries. When he went back, he was surprised. He said, they give me hundreds of dinars. Then he said, Qadr zar zargar shenasat. Qadr gohar gohari. The value of gold is only known by those who sell gold. <coughs> the value of silver is known by those who sell silver. If you give something from gold to the person who doesn't know gold and only sells iron, then he gives the value which is according to his own experience. You know, unfortunately, sometimes Muslims sold manuscripts which are valueless in few dinars to people who went you know, from other countries. Because for them, this was just a piece of paper. Those who went from Western museums, they knew how valuable these things are. They were ready to give lots of money, but those people who had them, they didn't know what is the value. So, you know, take this and don't show me. I don't want to see this. It's an old, you know, dusted book. They didn't know the value. So, unfortunately, when we see things and we don't have that knowledge, we think these are not important. But those who are experts, those who are RF, when they look at everything, you know, just, you know, next time, you know, for example, if you see a fruit, just look at this apple, this, I don't know, orange, how beautiful it is, how nice it is designed. The same soil, the same water, but gives different fruits, different tastes. You know how many types of grapes are there? How many types of mangoes are there? So this cannot be something by chance. So sometimes because we unfortunately don't think about these things, we take them very simple. So a summary of argument from design is that there are three dimensions for design. One is everything has an end. Uh, everything is created for a purpose. And if they are not stopped, they go towards their end and there is no confusion for them. They know what they should achieve. The second is the structure that exists in everything. It can be an animal, it can be a bird, it can be an insect, it can be an organ in human body, it can be even non-living beings. Even it can be water, it can be soil. There is a magnificent creature. You know, one of the things that we say in Dua Kumail, we say, وَبِعَظَمَتَكَ الَّتِي مَلَعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah's greatness has filled everything. So even a seed is great because Allah's greatness is manifested in that. So if till end of your life you want to understand even one seed, you cannot understand everything. Why? Because Allah's greatness is there. There is always something more to understand. And the third is the harmony. Everything in this world is making a system, a harmonious system. There is no separation, there is no gap, there is no vacuum. What I do affects you, what you do affects me. There is interconnection. And then we said that this argument not only proves the existence of God, it also proves knowledge of God, it proves power of God. So, if you have question about this argument, you can put forward. 
inshallah, tomorrow we discuss argument of wujub or imkan or cosmological argument and argument of fitrah. But if you have any question about uh, design, you can mention now or tomorrow before I start. Again, I ask you if you have any question, you know, you can mention. Is there any question now or you want to think about it and tomorrow, inshallah, you can. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين